Okay, hi everybody. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Artemi Kolchinsky. Um, Artemi, please correct me if I say something, uh, uh, if I say anything wrong. So Artemi did his bachelor's in uh, New York University, followed by a PhD in Indiana University with Luis Rocha. He's a, a postdoctoral fellow at the, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Santa Fe Institute, working with uh, David Wolpert for several years. Now he's at the University of Biology Institute at the University of Tokyo working as well with uh, Sosuke Ito. And, uh, and next summer, as he already mentioned, he'll be a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow in the uh, Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. So it would be great to have him in, in Europe uh, with us. And uh, he has also done several research visits, including uh, the Instituto Gubenkian de Ciencia in Portugal, as well as an internship in LinkedIn, California. So um, uh, I guess in summary, he's not only a great uh, up and coming scientist, he's also very seem to be keen to explore the world. And uh, so, yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce Artemi and uh, he's gonna talk to us about information geometry of fluxes and forces in non-equilibrium thermodynamics. So go ahead, Artemi, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, Mauricio. You, you like memorized my whole- <laughs> I wrote it down, man. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really uh, happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about, this is recent work, so quite recent. Um, there's a preprint that you can see. Um, definitely like comments, critiques, thoughts are very welcome. And also I just want to say like, please interrupt me if you have any questions. I'd really, you know, it's much more fun if it's a back and forth or, or if you don't understand something, I'm happy to explain. Either maybe you can post it in the chat. I'll kind of try to keep an eye on the chat window or maybe you could just interrupt or tell Mauricio to interrupt. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, this is uh, a, um, a recent preprint um, and this is a joint work with Andreas Deschamps. Uh, uh, Kohei Yoshimura and Susuke Ito, and me and uh, Kohei are both working uh, with Susuke in his lab in the University of Tokyo, studying information geometry, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And this actually is a kind of, I probably won't have too much time to, to talk about it today. This is a kind of um, follow-up on a, another recent paper that we wrote, the same group of people, which we, we sort of started from actually kind of Euclidean geometric formulation, and we realized that it has a information geometric formulation. Um, I can talk about it in questions if you're interested, but that's it's a kind of follow up. So uh, what uh, what we do in this paper and what I'll explain today is uh, that we define an information geometry of fluxes uh, in non equilibrium systems. And then we use it to define a decomposition of entropy production into so-called housekeeping and excess terms. And I'll explain to you what those are and why they're interesting. And um, we'll use that decomposition to derive thermodynamic trade-offs between things like precision, speed, and uh, thermodynamic cost. And uh, I just want to mention that uh, this general formalism that I'm going to be talking about today, it applies both to linear and nonlinear systems. So linear systems, you know, we're thinking of things like stochastic master equations, sometimes called Markovian jump processes. This might be, for example, the location of particle or particles on a lattice that are hopping around or, you know, a protein that can be in one of several configurations that's hopping around those configurations. And basically, the state of the system is the distribution over those uh, different configurations. And um, nonlinear systems, I'm thinking about discrete systems uh, like chemical reaction networks that have uh, that are evolved according to um, uh, rate equations, and they can display genuine nonlinear interesting phenomena like oscillations, bistability, multistability, and chaos. Okay, so those are kind of the, the, the domain we're thinking about. Uh, discrete space, uh, and, and we're going to be working in continuous time. So uh, this talk will proceed as follows. I'll tell you about non-equilibrium thermodynamics and the house Can I inter access can problem. I inter oh, yes. Can I ask a quick of question? Uh, you said it works for discrete systems. Do you think where you're, you can also say something about continuum systems, uh, like spatially extended systems, for instance? or? Yes, just a natural mm -hmm. extension, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that would be a, a natural extension. Yep. Mm -hmm. So usually we haven't done it. So I, uh, I don't want to say, but for at least uh, 
is, I think it would be pretty straightforward, at least to extend it to things like Fokker Planck uh, equations uh, and uh, probably also reaction diffusion equations and things like that. But we haven't done it. Um, I should say that, you know, also this is kind of, uh, I, I would say the style is more physics than math. So it's kind of going for uh, maybe, it's not necessarily aiming for maximum generality a priori, I would say. Um, uh, then I'll discuss the, the decomposition and then the, the speed limits on uncertainty relations. So what do I mean by non-equilibrium thermodynamics and what, what is the housekeeping excess problem? So I generally, I think of thermodynamics as the science of understanding what transformations are allowed by the fundamental laws of physics, things like conservation of energy, uh, the first law, things like uh, increase of entropy, and the second law. And uh, in this uh, project, we're going to be interested in a particular quantity, which is called the entropy production rate. And this is the increase of the entropy of the system. This is here is like the, the Shannon entropy of the system. Uh, and uh, this is going to be the um, entropy increase of the environment, which is going to be like a large reservoir or set of reservoirs in equilibrium. And so to make this a bit more concrete, we can imagine a piston that has some gas in it and we uh, compress the gas. And so we're going to be maybe decreasing the entropy of the system because we're compressing the volume. We're going to be generating some heat in the environment. Uh, if the environment is a heat bath, we can write that the increase of the entropy of the environment in this form. And the second law of thermodynamics in this case says that the entropy production rate is going to be non-negative. Now, uh, that's, this is, in some sense, this is kind of classic thermodynamics. And what I mean by that is that this inequality, uh, this, this non-negativity, it becomes saturated by reversible processes, thermodynamically reversible processes, which basically are going to have to be close to equilibrium throughout. So they, this can be saturated if the piston is compressed very, very slowly so that the gas remains close to equilibrium throughout. And non-equilibrium thermodynamics is trying to derive uh, similar kinds of fundamental laws, but that can be tight even far from equilibrium. So, so even for irreversible transformation. And uh, there's many of these types of relations that have been uncovered. It's kind of a rapidly growing field. Uh, the, one of the types or class that people are very interested in, uh, I might call generally trade-offs. And a trade-off is some kind of relationship or inequality between some level of functional performance and some level of uh, thermodynamic cost, which is usually going to be entropy production, so that the amount of uh, increase of entropy. So um, let me give you an example. This is a kind of classic inequality. This just comes from the second law. Uh, this says that the, um, in, you know, any change in the entropy uh, of the system has to be balanced by the change of the entropy of the environment. Sometimes this is called Landauer's bound in uh, more information theoretic settings. And but this is kind of a classic inequality. This is an inequality from genuine non-equilibrium inequality. This is called the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, a very active area of study. And it basically says that if we have some current observable, so this might count the number of times that, let's say, an enzymatic cycle has completed a cycle, or the number of times that a molecular motor has jumped to the right, or something like that, this says that the mean square divided by the variance, which is a measure of the precision of that current, is serves as a lower bound on the thermodynamic entropy production. So this, this, you know, in 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 equilibrium, this this is going to vanish, so it becomes trivial. But the point is that it says something. It, it says, why might you want to be far from equilibrium? Well, you might want to be far from equilibrium in order to have a high precision. And another uh, re closely related trade-off that people are exploring is called the thermodynamic speed limit. So the thermodynamic speed is basically, the speed is how fast your distribution is changing. We can, we can put it like that. And the thermodynamic speed limit says that uh, the, the speed with which your distribution is changing divided by the activity, the activity is we can think of as the total number of, uh, of jumps that the system is performing per unit time is bounded by uh, the entropy production rate. Again, this says that if you're in equilibrium, 
this, you know, both sides have to be zero. So you can't be changing over time. So the other concept that I should introduce is a non-equilibrium steady state. And a non-equilibrium steady state is a distribution in which is constant, it's not changing in time, but the entropy production rate is non-negative. And uh, as I'll get to later, this is a signature of what are called non-conservative forces. It's a signature that the system is not just relaxing to some, some free energy potential. And uh, examples of non-equilibrium steady states could include things like hurricanes. So there's entropy production because energy is moved from the warm ocean to the cool air, even though the hurricane as a whole stays relatively uh, you know, stationary. Um, another example might be like a ribosome, which is churning out peptides. So if we think of it as a cycle, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's circulating around the cycle, turning free floating amino acids into proteins. And, it's, uh, and it's, so it's gonna be the state of the ribosome can be treated as stationary, but it's gonna be paying for that. Uh, for, for, and it's gonna be paying by turning ATP into heat. And uh, the, the, so non-equilibrium steady states are of great interest. They're kind of one generalization of, of, of equilibrium states, a very important generalization. But what happens is that many of the thermodynamic trade-offs and bounds that we know and love become trivial uh, in steady states or near steady states. And uh, what I mean is, you know, for example, if we have something like Clausius inequality, which says, well, the change of the entropy of the system has to be balanced by the uh, increase of the um, entropy of the environment. Well, uh, you know, the left-hand side is going to be close to zero or zero near steady state, but the right-hand side can be really large. So this inequality becomes completely trivial. I mean, in the limit, it says zero is greater than, you know, minus infinity. Uh, or similarly, if we think about the speed limit, right? So the, in the speed limit, we're going to be, if we're near steady state, this is going to be zero or near zero because the distribution is not moving by definition, but this can be arbitrarily large because... Sorry, uh, we are based. One yes. Can you repeat maybe what is L in the in this uh, in this inequality? L is going to be uh, the speed with which the distribution is changing, and there's it can be different measured in different ways. So I'm kind of keeping it general now, but uh, we can think of it as um, uh, some kind of measure. It can be total variation distance per time, for example, if, if you're familiar with that or Wasserstein distance per time. So how fast is the distribution evolving? What, what do you mean exactly? So in steady what, what, what mm -hmm. do you mean exactly by a near non-equilibrium steady state? I don't really get what that means. Uh, when, when, uh, when, so when, when the rate of change of P is small. So remember steady state, DTP is zero. That's the that's the the change. This can also be the concentration vector in a deterministic chemical system mm -hmm. instead of a probability vector. So that's near steady state. So our system is changing, uh, not changing or changing very slowly. Okay. Right. So think of the hurricane. The hurricane maybe is it's actually changing. Right, but it's maybe changing much slower than the rates at which heat is flowing through it. So that could be. So the whole idea behind the housekeeping and excess decomposition, which I'm not going to define just yet, I just accept at a high level, is that maybe, maybe we can split the entropy production rate into two parts. And uh, one part is going to be called the housekeeping part. And one part is going to be the excess part. And however they're defined, we expect the excess part to vanish in steady state. So, so this is the this is the we can we can kind of think of uh, entropy production. Entropy production rate is a measure of non-equilibrium. It vanishes when we're in equilibrium. We can kind of think of being out of equilibrium as possibly arising from two different uh, contributions. One is we're not stationary, so we're clearly not in equilibrium because, um, because the distribution is changing. The other is 
we're out of equilibrium because there's, uh, you know, the distribution is not changing, but there's fluxes. So for example, uh, you know, a molecular machine in steady state that's undergoing fluxes and cycling around is gonna have entropy production. And so this is trying to capture these two parts of entropy production into separate terms. And the idea is that if we could define a proper decomposition like this, then maybe we could have tighter inequalities that don't become trivial in steady state. So for example, maybe we could have an excess, an excess EPR, ex entropy production rate speed limit that says, oh no, the excess entropy production bounds how fast we can evolve. So that where, when we're in steady state, it doesn't matter that we're dumping a ton of uh, energy from a hot bath to a cold bath. We can't, we can't be, uh, we can't be changing. So that's the kind of general idea that, that to split apart, uh, if we want to have a trade-off between a cost entropy production and, and, uh, and a fun functional property like, like precision or speed, then we want that to be as tight as possible, right? To give as tight of a bound as possible. And, and so we want to decompose it to get a tighter bound. There's a bit of background noise. Uh, yeah, there is. Sorry. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay. Maybe we can, uh, maybe we can mute it for a second. It's okay if it's the oh, if it's the room. It's, uh, no, we'll mute it for a second. Yeah. Maybe. Um, there's one decomposition like this, which is uh quite well known, the most famous one, which is called Hatano Sasa decomposition, or it's also called adiabatic and non adiabatic decomposition, and uh. It's essentially an information theoretic decomposition that says, okay, you know, imagine this is your state of your system at time t. So this is the probability vector, maybe it's the concentration vector. And this is the stationary state. But over time, you evolve to, to this, uh, to this new, new state. And so it says, well, you know, the excess term should vanish if we're at stationary state. So maybe we can define it as the contraction of the kobach liber divergence, which is a, an information theoretic measure of distance. Basically, maybe we can measure it as the contraction of the kobach liber divergence to the steady state as the system evolves over time. So how, mu how, close, how much closer is it getting to steady state? And we can then define the housekeeping contribution as, as the remainder. And uh, this, is, this is an interesting approach, but it's, it has some issues. So one of the issues is it's, simply undefined for systems without, without steady states. So this could be things like oscillators, right? Uh, Nonlinear systems, chaotic systems, um, and at least without stable steady states. It can also give un, uh, not negative values in certain cases, such as under damp systems, which I can talk about in question time. This is systems with momentum. Uh, chemical reaction systems that don't obey a very, very restrictive condition called complex balance and things like that. And we never want, you know, one of the things we, we don't want is we never want these, these terms to be negative because that's highly unphysical. If we think of these as capturing different contributions to the entropy production, you know, according to the second law, one thing they should be is both be non-negative um, because they determine essentially different aspects of irreversibility, right? So they should have a, a definite sign. And um, it's also really hard to connect this to measurements. It's defined in a very uh, mathematical way. And so people have argued that it's, 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 it's not really clear what its physical meaning is. So our goal in this project is to actually use information geometric ideas to define a, a, a different and maybe better decomposition that um, solves these issues and then to see if we can derive uh, trade-offs using our decomposition. Um, any questions at this point? Great. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, information geometry and entropy production, how they relate. And uh, let me first write out, so I wrote entropy production as the, uh, you know, in this form as the increase of entropy of the system and the, and the change of the entropy of the environment. Uh, it's actually um, gonna be more useful to write entropy production in, in this bilinear form, 
where uh, this is a vector of non-negative fluxes that occur across different channels or reactions. These could be different ways a particle can jump, different chemical reactions that can happen. These are going to be the one-way fluxes across those different jumps or, or reactions. And these are the so-called thermodynamic forces across each of those reactions. OK, so this is a very standard expression uh, in, uh, in thermodynamics. It's uh, this, this flux force. We can uh, think of them as these are kind of conjugate. If you're familiar with equilibrium thermodynamics, it's very closely related to conjugate variables in equilibrium thermodynamics, like uh, temperature and energy. Right. Uh, and or inverse temperature and energy. And the other thing that uh, we have to keep in mind is that there's this very fundamental relation, which is the basis of most results in non equilibrium thermodynamics, which is called the flux force relation, which says that the thermodynamic force across a given reaction is given by the log ratio of the, uh, of, of the, so so this is this indicates the flux in the forward direction across this reaction, and I'm going to write this J tilde to indicate the rever the flux across the reverse reaction. So this is a chemical reaction. This is just the forward flux and the backward flux, and the thermodynamic force is given by the uh, irreversibility, so the imbalance between them. We see that if we're in equilibrium, then the two fluxes are equal to each other. There's no net current, and this is going to vanish. And, you know, uh, I mean, the, the important thing to keep in mind is if you're kind of thinking mathematically, this is just a definition. But for physicists, this is not just a definition because this, this thermodynamic force is like something you could measure in certain cases with a col colorometer or by measuring energy flows. It has an independent meaning. Uh, and uh, this is just stated in terms of kinetics and dynamics. So this is a very deep relationship between something you could measure with, you know, by measuring energy flows. And this is something you could measure by looking at the dynamics of a system. So, uh, so which... I'm sorry, I have a question. Um, well, if there's like only forward flux and no backward flux, so like, uh, right. Have, like, uh, absorbing states or something like that, like, no, no back. Right. So, <laughs> So that would be that would be called thermodynamically consistent. Uh, now, uh, what does that mean? I mean, so technically, you know, in in principle, like every reaction is reversible. Uh, at the microscopic level, you know, the thing is, it could be so far from reversibility. Reversible meaning there is going to be, if it's possible one way, it's also possible the opposite way. Um, you know, many times, especially in biology or chemistry, like it's so far from that, that we just treat the backward reaction as irreversible because there's no way to measure its rate. It's so rare. Like gasoline, you know, the, the, the combustion of gasoline never happens. We never observe it happening in reverse because the thermodynamic force is so great. Um, so let's just, let's just, so you can define thermodynamic force in other ways in that case, but then you can't use this, uh, you, you can't use this fu more, more fundamental approach. I guess I would say that. But in principle, uh, everything is, is reversible, possibly at a small rate. Um, so if we just plug this in, then we have this expression for, uh, for the um, entropy production rate. And, um, just to give you two brief examples, uh, so we can consider this as a linear master equation, uh, stochastic jump process, Markovian jump process, whatever you want to call it. So we have three states, and the one-way fluxes, for example, from x to y would be given by the probability of being in state x times the rate of transitions from x to y. And if we write uh, the, we plug these fluxes into the entropy production rate, we get this expression. Uh, it's very common in stochastic thermodynamics. You'll often see it. Sometimes it's called the Schnackenberg formula. Um, we can also do the same thing for a nonlinear chemical reaction network. This is a classic example of a nonlinear oscillator uh, defined by three reactions. We can define these nonlinear uh, fluxes. And again, the entropy production rate now at the deterministic level of concentrations is going to be given uh, by this expression. 
one thing I'm going to mention is that uh, for both of these systems, we're going to use the, the following fact that we can write the evolution of their state vector, whether it's a probability distribution or, or two concentrations in this case, uh, as this continuity equation, where J is the set of fluxes and B is the so-called incidence matrix that maps, which basically tells us which fluxes hit which states, okay? So uh, this, is, this is a discrete uh, space version of a continuity equation where, where B is the negative gradient operator. If so if you've seen continuity equations, this should look very familiar. Um, for a, a, a chemical reaction network, B is the so-called stoichiometric matrix. So it tells us which reactions consume which species and how many of them and and oh, and which when produce and, and which species they produce. So we're going to see this matrix B show up again, uh, but I just want to show you how the fluxes are connected to the dynamics here. Uh, and also I want to point out that this system is, is going to be linear, so it's going to relax uh, to uh, basically a unique uh, steady state, or at least in each cons conserved, uh, well, if it's irreducible, this one will relax to unique steady state, and this one doesn't have to. So this might exhibit oscillations, as you see here, because it's not linear. Great. So uh, well, uh -huh. can I ask a question again? Sorry. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, so for that you can do in principle for any dynamical system, right? So if I have, a, and I, I guess I, I, I don't see how you do that more generally. Like if you have like a, a dynamical system uh, that's autonomous, like, you know, first derivative of a vector equal a bunch of nonlinear functions on the right-hand side. What you say, I guess, is that the right-hand side uh, is what you can use uh, to construct your entropy production, right? Uh, is there like a generic way of doing it generically? Um, I so so if I have a flux, maybe sorry, maybe the notation is a bit too um, too curt, but uh, too short. So J is going to depend on the whole concentration vector, right? So J will depend on P. J will depend on the concentration of X and Y. And J is basically given these concentrations, given the kinetic parameters, how fast the reactions happen. Um, what are the fluxes? Now, these fluxes, they're going to transport energy, mass. They can transport different quantities. They will also transport probability. So these uh, matrices operators B tell us which fluxes change which probability, which, which, which probability values. Now, um, mm -hmm. can you write a continuity equation for any... Uh, was that your question or yeah can you always write uh no you i don't think you can necessarily always write any dynamical system i mean uh i mean, I mean you could maybe in a tri a tri uh -huh. yeah, i'm trying to you know, let me be concrete so, so here i have a bunch i have like a mechanical system that's been driven by coils and you know uh, dissipated by friction mm -hmm. and so on i guess the question is a uh, you know, uh, I can also model that as a couple of uh, nonlinear uh, ODEs and uh, that make up uh, a dynamical system. If I want to express the entropy mm -hmm. production, how should I do it, I guess? That's my, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Or is it uh, even possible to do it for... No. Right, I mean, it kind of has to be worked out. So this, so this, this is what works for stochastic. It's the, each, each level of description, mm -hmm. There is there. I mean, in general, there is for different classes. People have worked it out, and it usually looks very similar. It's always about a breaking of time reversal symmetry. So, uh, in this, this is the expression for basically stochastic master equations. Um, this is for deterministic chemical reaction networks. Uh, what your device looks like, it might be it might be like an electronic electric circuit subject to Kirchhoff's laws. So. There's an expression for it that's very similar to these expressions. Uh, I should also add, this is important to keep in mind. This is not just math, right? Like we can define this for any, basically for any dynamical system. The, the, the tricky thing is can when does this connect to uh, when does this connect to thermodynamically measurable quantities, energy flows, flows of conserved quantities? So 
generally, this is this is very general. One 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 case where it won't hold is uh, systems with momentum, which are called underdamped systems. But there's a very simple extension of this expression that accounts for that. Uh, for systems with momentum, the whole concept of time reversal symmetry has to be modified, right? Uh, like uh, because, uh, for example. A planet can cycle around the sun endlessly without dissipating, uh, and that's a that that's that that looks like a breaking of time reversal symmetry unless you are careful with what you're doing. But this is this is quite general, yeah. Thanks. Um, so next, let's let's consider this expression, which I wrote several times before. This this. Uh, expression for the entropy production rate. And uh, well, well, I guess before I do that, let me say what is information geometry. We're going to consider that expression from the point of view of information geometry. So information geometry is just uh, a, a way to think about geometry in the space of uh, probability distributions. Uh, and where distances are going to be defined basically in terms of bits or information theoretic units. It actually doesn't have to be restricted to probability distributions. We can define it for a set uh, for the space of non-negative vectors or non-negative uh, uh, functions if we want. And uh, the kind of most uh, essential quantity in information geometry is uh, the Kullback Lieber divergence. Uh, so this is the Kullback Lieber divergence between two non-negative vectors of the same size. So you probably, if uh, you, some of you might have seen just the first part before, uh, this is a more general expression wh which applies when X and Y don't sum up to the same quantity. When they sum up to the same quantity, this, this just cancels and we get back the regular Kubik library divergence. But this is, this often appears in chemical thermodynamics uh, because um, X and Y might indicate uh, concentrations of different species, which don't have to add up to the same quantity. If these are probabilities, then of course they have to both add up to one. Uh, there's a lot of books on information geometry. If you're interested, here's a recent one. Many of them are quite math, I think a little bit overly mathematical, but, um, uh, but they're very interesting. If, if you're interested in more pointers, feel free to email me. Um, uh, can, I, can I ask a first question? What? Yes. So, I mm -hmm. mean, uh, here this, uh, in this uh, information geometry setup, this X and Y would represent probability mass functions. So like discrete in some sense that they have like a, some probability assigned to each discrete state. Would that make, would that make sense? Just, so we'll see in the slide. So in our case, they're going to correspond to fluxes. Ah, I see, I see. Okay, then I, then I wait. Yeah, but in general, in the most ask, general. I was, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um, can I ask a very naive question as well? I don't yes. know. Yeah, right. Okay. So why is this called geometry? <laughs> um. Well, this is not called geometry, but oh, but we'll see. I think we'll see oh, yeah. because we're going to use things like uh, Pythagorean theorem. I mean, information geometry is much broader than what I'm going to talk about today. It it really treats it uses Kullback Lieber to define a metric, a Riemannian metric, and then studies geodesics using that metric. Studies so it's just it's uh it studies differential geometry with that with that metric among other things. We're going to use uh just the Pythagorean theorem, which I'll get to. Okay, thanks. So we have this expression. And uh, if we now recall the expression for the entropy production rate, it's actually not hard to see that the entropy production rate is like the Kubik Lieber divergence between the, forward, the set of forward fluxes and the set of reverse fluxes. Now, here I don't have this you know, minus j rho plus j tilde rho, but actually that cancels because the forward and backward fluxes add up to the same thing. In some systems, they don't have to add up to the same thing, but this, this, this is still valid. This is, this is kind of a very, very universal relationship that has been noted before in passing, but I think nobody has really run with it like we did in this paper with this, with, by, that we can treat the entropy production rate as an information theoretic distance between forward and backward fluxes. So if I was to draw the picture, we can imagine J, J is a, is a vector of non-negative values, one for each reaction. 
tell, uh, telling us per second how many times does that reaction happen. J tilde is the same size non-negative vector telling us how many times per second does the reverse reaction happen. And the entropy production rate is, the, is a measure of how different they are. If they're the same, that means everything is looking forward and backwards the same, we're in equilibrium. If they're really different, we're, we're producing a lot of entropy. Now, what is, so we know what J is, we know what J tilde is. What is, what is this thing in between them? How do we, what, what, I mean, I drew an arrow, what is this space? So we actually gonna embed these in a continuous space of flux vectors, right? So these are non-negative vectors, one for each reaction. And this is gonna be, uh, this continuous family is, uh, space is gonna be an exponential family. And it's gonna be defined in this way. So M is the number of reactions. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a parameterized vector J theta, which is the reverse reaction times E weight tilted, tilted by this theta. So rho again is the index of the reaction. So this is just reaction by reaction. We're gonna tilt it according to these tilting parameters. And we're gonna then define, basically we can define the kolbeck leibert divergence between members of this family. It can actually be simplified into a nice form, which I won't mention, but, uh, and we're gonna just write this, the kolbeck leibert divergence between these non-negative fluxes at one theta and another theta, I'm gonna write like this. So um, recall that the, the, the entropy production rate is, the Kolbeck library between the forward and backward fluxes. The backward fluxes are recovered when we set theta to zero, right? Because this is zero, this is one, and we just get tilde rho. Now, we also have this relation of local detailed balance, which says the thermodynamic force across rho is uh, given by the ratio of the backward and forward fluxes, the log ratio. So if we plug in F here, we get J tilde times J over J tilde. And what we recover is we recover the forward fluxes at the parameter F. So we can think of this theta parameter as a kind of force. It's a force that moves us away from the origin, the origin being the reverse fluxes. It moves us away from the origin towards, uh, well, whatever direction we wanna go to. But if we go towards the direction of the thermodynamic forces, then we recover the actual forward forces. Um, is there any, any questions about this, 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 I haven't gotten to the geometry yet, but this, this yeah, setup, I have a, yes. a, a just, a again, a, a, a naive question to understand this better. So this, this setup up, uh, function or, or parameter is another thermodynamic force. Is that some sort of a variable that you can tune as an, uh, external yeah. or something like that i mean in terms of that's a great that's yeah, a great okay. question okay so so this is this is like uh it's we should just for now we should think about this uh maybe a bit mathematically so this is like we're, we're given two points and we want to put these in a continuous space. And so we parameterize the space by theta so that one of the points is at the origin and the other point is at F. Now, uh, it's not, so, so, so we can kind of think of it as a coordinate system for fluxes. That's the, maybe that's a good way to think of it. But, but I'm gonna sometimes call it forces because because uh, you know when when that coordinate system is equal to the force, we recover the actual fluxes. But it's it's uh, there's a lot there's a fine point here, which is it's not we should not necessarily think of it in general that any theta is like is like a force. It's a coordinate system. Okay, thanks. So maybe one more question in that direction. So is, is this theta uh, you can think of it as a real number or as a complex number or something beyond that? So, so it's a, it's uh, a vector, real number, right? Right. right. So, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, we froze. There, no, we there froze is. for a bit. Uh, we'll get back. Are you there? Me? Me? No, no. It was us. It was us. Somehow. Uh, we we've been here. Yeah, you'll be here. Just one second. <laughs> Just one second. <laughs> So, 
so uh Mauricio are you yeah so so yeah so I was just wondering if uh theta if, if we could have yeah, a meaning so, to have a complex theta value of sorts some kind that's of a really uh that's a super interesting question that's like something we've actually discussed a little bit uh we don't know how to so this callback library divergence is defined for real valued uh positive real valued vectors. Uh, it's really interesting to think what happens if it's, whether it could be meaningfully defined for, uh, I mean, you know, we could plug in complex number here, but then what do we do? What do we do? Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, but it's, that's, that's really, it, that's a really, it's a, it's a very interesting point. Yeah. And um, yeah, it actually touches upon some, yeah more recent work. Uh, yeah, but can uh, I continue? Can I can uh -huh. I ask another question? I mean, sorry to interrupt again. Also about this mm -hmm. data. So I was asking about the interpretation, but can you also see this as a way, uh, yeah, to change your uh, thermodynamic forces uh, in, in the system? So for example, by, uh, by, okay, so just an idea, just raising temperature or changing some conditions at, at the, uh, for the reverse and the forward process. So that uh, is, is yeah, that so that's you... why I, uh, so that's that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So um, here's what I mean by tricky. Um, in, in so near equilibrium, yes, uh, you don't necessarily. If that doesn't make sense to you, that that's true. But far from equilibrium, that's no longer true. What I mean is, imagine we calculate the for a given theta, we calculate the log ratio of the forward and reverse fluxes across the reaction. It's no, not true in general that that's going to equal theta. Okay. Right. So there's a, there's a, that's why I think it's better. So for F it will, right? For F it will, uh, but in general, it won't. That's why I don't want, I, I say it's more like a coordinate system. Yeah. Okay. Now okay. Uh, I'll uh, stick with that. Thanks. So I'm going to continue. I don't know if people are connected again or not. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Uh, can I um, ask one intermediate yes. question? Really quick one. Yes. So why is the choice of other divergence used? Because it's not a true distance measure, right? For frozen. Why is the KL divergence used? Yeah. Because entropy production is the entropy production rate is the KL divergence. Yeah. Okay, but you're using it in, in a geometry sense, right? And the KL divergence is not a true distance measure. Well, we oh, uh, I so again, I'll so it's not a true distance measure, but we're gonna the properties we're gonna use are not gonna require to be a distance measure. Okay, a, a true distance, yeah. but uh, we can divergence, uh, asymmetric distance we can call yeah. it. So, um. Yeah, it becomes again. It becomes a distance measure in the limit when in the kind of equilibrium limit when things are close. But you're right. It's not a in general. It's not a distance measure. Yep. Um. So uh, and by, by that is just meant that it's not symmetric. Yeah. Um. And okay, so we have this. This we have this space. So now we have this space in between the the forward fluxes and the backward fluxes. So the backward flux is the origin, and we're far from it if we're far from equilibrium as determined by the forces. We and 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 this distance. This is just the entropy production rate. Now I'm going to introduce what's called the uh, Pythagorean theorem for uh, for Kullback Leiber divergence, and uh, it works as follows. So let's imagine we have some linear subspace of forces okay so here i'm kind of you know abusing terminology a little bit we can think linear subspace of thetas we could say uh but like i said it kind of acts like a force but this linear subspace of the parameters of the exponential family and we can now say okay given an f how far is it from uh this subspace what's the closest uh, element of this uh, subspace, and that's going to give us a phi. Now, um, uh, we're going to call this phi star, the, the, the point where uh, the projection of F onto this subspace. And the Pythagorean theorem says the following, that this, this, this distance, really here it's more like, it acts more like Euclidean distance squared than anything. So, but this callback library divergence is given by the sum of this 
uh, Kalbach Library Divergence and plus this Kalbach Library Divergence. And uh, so this is the, basically the equivalent of Pythagorean theorem. It says that this is an orthog orthogonal angle, or you know, this is the right angle. Um, and the other thing it says is that there's a dual re representation of this point, uh, which is uh, very interesting. And it's the projection of the origin essentially onto the, 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 this linear family that contains uh, F. So, so A is, uh, specifies this subspace. It's adjoint uh, A transpose specifies this subspace. Now, this is a subspace of thetas, I call them forces. This is a subspace of fluxes. Okay, and so uh, if we now see, you know, map the, the, the actual fluxes here under theta, then this is going to have the same, uh, the same values. So this is kind of, we can think of these as expectation values. This shows up all the time in maximum entropy, if you're familiar with that, which where we can either, for example, in maximum entropy, we can either, um, uh, uh, we can either optimize the temperature or we can fit the uh, average energy. So this is like the manifold of where the average energy is constrained. And this is uh, the manifold parameterized by different temperatures. And uh, there's also a dual representation of, uh, of uh, this distance, which is written as a Legendre transform. And that means it's a maximization. And so, this is going to be really useful, although I probably uh, won't have time to go deeply into it. This is going to be really useful because this gives us uh, a whole infinite family of lower bounds on this distance. Well, basically, we're going to see that one of these is going to be the housekeeping entropy production, and one of them is going to be the um, excess entropy production. But we'll get to that. So recall that this is just the entropy production rate, this blue line. And so uh, we can use the Pythagorean theorem to decompose the entropy production rate into these two terms. The first one is the contribution to the entropy production rate uh, due to this, these forces F being outside of this uh, subspace. When F is in this subspace, this term vanishes by the definition of the projection, right? And uh, when, and this second term is the contribution to the entropy production rate that's due to this arrow. That's due to the contribution that comes from within the subspace. And this applies to any subspace uh, of, of uh, forces and fluxes uh, as, as specified by this uh, operator A. Okay. So um, this is kind of, uh, this is very closely related to maximum entropy principle is closely related to something called uh, maximum caliber. Uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, but now it's actually not even working on probabilities. It's actually working more generally on the space of fluxes. Is, is there a question? Yeah, there's um, just um, again some mm -hmm. clarification. So you talk about you talk about the Pythagorean uh, theorem here. Yeah? So this is, uh, mm -hmm. of course, that's uh, just the square of the, 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 the sum of the squares. But where is the square here? I mean, why is the uh, kuber leigler like um, uh, the square? I would say it's a linear distance, not so where, why does this X at the square distance? Is that- Why would you say it's a linear distance? Well, I, that's what I thought actually, but is that, <laughs> clearly it's not then. No, 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 it's more like a square. So uh, for example, when, uh, when, when, when the two arguments are very close to each other, uh, it's it scales as uh, as distance squared. Okay, it so that's, that's the first it. order. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, no, that explains something. Right, fantastic. No, it's very interesting. I mean, thanks. Uh huh. So, um, but this this is probably the best way to really be convinced that it's a square. <laughs> maybe uh, somehow I don't know. Um, okay, great. So maybe you might uh, kind of gave you a little bit of the preview to where I'm going. Uh, let me just go back to this concept of a non-equilibrium steady state. And as I mentioned, non-equilibrium steady states happen when the thermodynamic forces are not conservative. And 
what does it mean when a, when a force is conservative or not conservative? So a conservative force, you, uh, you might be uh, familiar with um, a conservative force, uh, conservative force being like the gradient of uh, potential. And recall, I, I said this was the B was a discrete gradient. So that was it's the, actually the divergence, the discrete divergence. So it's adjoint is like the, the it was the negative divergence. It's adjoint. This is like the gradient. And so basically, what this says is the force is conservative if the force vector can be written as the change, the drop of some potential across each reaction, some fixed potential, where this is a function that's defined for every state or every chemical species. And uh, this, this is the continuity equation that I wrote earlier. So this is, you know, this is the discrete space analog of the duality between the, the divergence and the gradient. And a non-conservative force is uh, just anything that cannot be written in this way. Like that is not, um, that's not the drop of a potential. And I'm not sure I'll have time to get into it, but basically, uh, non-equilibrium steady state will have cycling and then cycling cannot be written in general, cannot be written as uh, just a, a gradient flow. So here I have an example. Uh, I might kind of skip over it in the interest of time or at least cover it very briefly, but uh, basically in a master equation, the, what's called the condition of detailed balance, you'll often see this basically says that the ratio of the, of the, of the forward and reverse fluxes can be written in this way. And you see for any transition, you see immediately that this is like the potential for, for X, this is a potential for Y, and the log ratio is the drop of this potential. This potential, it's like a relative entropy potential. Um, but, you know, another way to think about it is just the, the kind of textbook definition of conservative forces in physics. Now, uh, um, the core idea is that we we consider, as I mentioned, you know, we can consider uh, subspaces of forces. So we're going to consider the subspace of conservative forces as defined by this matrix, and we're going to quantify the housekeeping term by the degree to which the actual force is different from the closest conservative force. And uh, Basically, you know, by definition, this vanishes if F is in this subspace. So it vanishes if the forces are conservative. Uh, we can also show by the duality, which I'm not sure I'll have time to, but basically recall that uh, uh, that BJ is the evolution of the, I think I have it on the previous slide. BJ is the evolution of the probability distribution. So it turns out that um, if the, uh, housekeeping term is equal to the entropy production term, that happens when the system is in steady state. So the excess vanishes. And of course, this has the form, this deviation from being conservative has the form of an information geometric projection. So uh, I think uh, this is kind of the key slide, but it, it shouldn't be too scary because I already kind of covered the, the, the geometric picture. But um, uh, let me just kind of walk through this. So this is the basis of our decomposition. F specifies the forward dynamics in this exponential family. Zero, the origin specifies the reverse dynamics. The blue thing is all of the thetas that can be written in this way. Okay, it's a subspace that basically represents forces that look like they're falling down some potential. And so the distance between the actual force and the subspace is the housekeeping term. And the, the remainder is the excess term. So basically it's the, uh, the distance from the, from the projected conservative force to the origin. And, uh, uh, you know, just I mentioned a few things. This is always well-defined and non-negative. So it doesn't have the, uh, it's much more general than the Hatano Sasa decomposition. And uh, we can also show that this vanishes when the system is in steady state because of the duality between B and, and B transpose, basically. And uh, it gives uh, thermodynamic speed limits, which is the final section of my talk. And I know I've been talking for a while, so I'm going to maybe go a little bit quicker. Through that. 
but is there any questions now maybe well, just some final clarification. So again, if we go to equilibrium, then these two points, uh, the zero and the F are on top of each other. And if you, exactly. and if you go to steady state, it, it just means then, that one is perpendicular the, to each other. It goes to the green one, to, to that one, you're right. Is that correct? We're, we're just yeah. perpendicular. So in, in steady state, the red line passes right. through the origin. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, then, uh, then everything mm -hmm. is uh, clear. Thanks. And if it's just the system relaxing to equilibrium, then this is in the manifold. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yes. Uh, sometimes, like uh, housekeeping entropy uh, is sort of given um, more the interpretation of sort of the entropy given in in uh, configuration changes, if I remember correctly. How does that reflect Sorry. On, uh, this analysis? Sorry, in what? Like the entropy that goes into the configuration changes of the system. Right. Like, or maybe rephrase my question. Can you give me like a more physical uh, definition of housekeeping versus access entropy? Like what, what does it do to the system? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, tell me if this is not clear. I'll kind of mention what I said in brief earlier. We can think of entropy production as arising from two factors. One is uh, real, so change, change of the distribution over time, relaxation. You're out of steady state and you're going towards steady state. Uh, the other is, even if you're in steady state, you're cycling. So you have internal cycles. And these cycles, they don't change your, your distribution, right? Just like a, a hurricane can be cycling, but it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's density vector stays constant, right? This is closely related to the Helmholtz decomposition. So you have a cycling contribution of the fluxes and you have a, a divergence contribution. And uh, the excess is the relaxation, it's the change. It's going from a non-steady state towards steady state. The um, housekeeping is the cycling. Does that help? Yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I meant, I guess, with cycling. I meant the, the changes of the configuration in your system that happen even if you are in a non-equilibrium steady state. You are, yes. You, go, you cycle through configuration changes. Yes. Right. Thanks. So, 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 so the, 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 you know, we, we can maybe talk about a little bit about later, but the key, key, I, the key answer to your question is if you're in steady state, the excess vanishes. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, are you going to give us like a system that we recognize in which you actually give the exact expressions for both of these things. Oh. Because uh, now it's all like, I, I, I understand the logic. Yeah, yeah. It's all, it's all higher. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe uh, I'll, I'll try. I'll have, I maybe not. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit abstract. I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to touch upon that. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, but I also should mention this is well defined even for systems without steady state. I mean, so it you know this is very general. There's nothing explicit here about uh, steady states. It happens that to be that if you're in steady state, one of them vanishes. Um, great. So let me uh, get to the final part, which is uh, th the 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 trade-offs. So as I mentioned. Uh, these trade-offs have the form of an inequality between entropy production rates and uh, uh, something you care about. So, for example, it might be the precision, the the the, the change of you know the cur the mean current squared and the and the fluctuations of that current. Um, uh, we basically can use our definition, or especially our definition of excess entropy production, to derive such thermodynamic uh, uncertainty relations. And um, I'll go over this uh, quickly, but as I mentioned, this, this is derived from the fact that 
Public library divergence has this dual representation, dual Legendre representation. It can be represented either as a minimization problem or a maximization problem. And by representing it as a maximization problem, gives us a whole family of lower bounds on it. And so if we define a flux, some observable, uh, some state observable phi, so phi is just a number, any number we assign to each state, then we can define its flux in this way. So basically how quickly is that expectation changing of phi? And we can define its activity and the activity, activity, you can just think of activity as the number of jumps for simplicity, number of jumps per second. Okay, so, so th those could be, in equilibrium activity can be really high because the jumps, the jumps are not changing anything, but the system is just fluctuating back and forth. And with a little bit of manipulation, we derive this far from equilibrium uncertainty relation, which basically says that the excess, just the excess part of the uh, entropy production bounds uh, the flux divided by the activity. And this is a weaker bound. So what this is saying is if you want to change, move any state observable, then it's not enough just to have high entropy production. You have to have high excess entropy production. You have to be changing. So this is, this is. I mean, there's two ways to think about this. This is kind of like making operational why we care about this quantity, not in, beyond the mathematical elegance that, you know, it bounds, it gives us a bound on the, on how fast or how much we can change uh, any observable. And Conversely, you know, we can measure this in a real system. We can take uh, bio, bio, system, measurements of a biological system. We can bound this quantity using just real world measurements. Here, I think I have, a, a, okay, so it's a bit of a, still a simple example, but imagine we have a master equation and it's just a cycle over um, eight states. And we, we, started a non non steady state distribution i think we we make the probability of the first state very large and the other ones are uniform and we all the rates are pointing to the uh, clockwise so there's going to be a cycling here but there's also even in steady state there's going to be a cycling but there's also going to be relaxation if we just we can define the following observable we can say the observable is is the probability of this state instantaneously increasing or decreasing? And if we define the, the, the flux of that observable, that's what's called the, the total variation distance speed. That's just how fast the distribution is changing under a total variation distance, which is a very uh, simple measure of, of uh, distance between distributions. So, you know, if we uh, basically rearrange this, we have this bound on how fast we can be changing. This is a kind of, you know, speed limit, which is saying uh, the excess entropy production uh, relative to the, to the activity bounds uh, the speed. And so I'm not sure this is as clear of an example as uh, maybe I should have given for people not, not super familiar with housekeeping excess entropy production, but basically we show that um, we get a really tight bound on how you know, we can say, well, how fast is it actually changing? And we can see how big the error is. And we just show that uh, it's tighter than, than other uh, bounds. Um, so again, this idea, the idea is that we're relating a dynamical property and a thermodynamic property. And if we were to compute this bound for uh, just the total entropy production, it would be off the chart. So it would, it would not be tight at all. Um, okay, so uh, I, that, I'm not sure that's a good example, but maybe we can return to it in questions. So we can also uh, integrate this over time and we can derive something called the thermodynamic speed limit. And this is says, if I want to move, a uh, let's say a, move a distribution or, 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 or achieve some uh, transformation over a fixed amount of time, how much do I have to dissipate? And uh, what we derive is a kind of minimum time needed to, to tr basically achieve a certain trans transformation of a certain length. So this could be, I want to go from one initial distribution to some final, a final distribution. And 
I have a certain time budget. How much do I have to dissipate? Well, it turns out that there's a minimum time. And as you approach the time, the amount you have to dissipate of excess entropy production actually diverges. And this is actually much uh, stronger than previously derived uh, speed limits. Previously derived speed limits, actually, they, they don't actually specify minimum time. They just say um, you have to be above uh, this function. But this actually says, no, as you basically, this line is when every jump is directed towards moving you in the direction you want to move. So that is as fast as you can possibly go, given, given the activity and given the time you have. And as you approach it, the transitions have to become absolutely irreversible. So basically, they have to be you know, one way, because every jump backwards takes you away from this line. And as they become one way, uh, you get you know, something finite divided by 0. Um, that's, that's it. I, I know this final part was probably uh, quite a lot to absorb, but uh, I'm just going to summarize and I'm happy to answer questions if we have time. So uh, we basically consider uh, an information geometry over a, a new kind of space, which is not the space of distributions or concentration vectors as typically uh, considered in maximum entropy and information geometry but over the space of the fluxes over the reaction. So it's really like thinking about an information geometry of the dynamics, so to speak. And uh, we use it to, to, to derive a new kind of decomposition. And uh, this decomposition gives us, it's operationally meaningful. It gives us uh, various kinds of trade-offs and it's always well-defined for a very broad range of systems. Um, uh, and because I think it's kind of getting at the heart of really what is, what we mean by by excess and, and housekeeping. So uh, again, these are the collaborators and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, th thank you, Artemi. I guess a uh, really interesting talk. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people were are, are interested in stuff. So if anybody has questions, uh, please go for it. Well, I don't know if I can start. Um, yes. So, I mean, uh, yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk, uh, Artemi. Uh, I, I, I already asked some questions, but one thing that um, I have in mind with these type of uh, problems, I mean, like a sort of quintessential uh, uh, problem is, of course, from biology, is, is molecular motors, uh, where you, mm -hmm. uh, you have some sort of a, indeed a cyclic reaction, things go forward and backwards, yeah, but overall they go forward, for example. So can mm -hmm. you actually express uh, these type of, um, yeah, what's it called? These type of uh, approaches uh, that you have uh, for this particular problem. Yeah? This is kind of a quintessential, mm -hmm. right? the, the, the big example, so to speak. Is it precisely what you said in this cyclic uh, circle that you actually showed before you can interpret this as moving over if I, if I will or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, um, so let me let me just say two things. So uh, first in the context of housekeeping excess and second in the more general framework where we talk about the information geometry, these fluxes and this just the decomposition, you know, the part due to being in the subspace part not being the subspace. Um, Usually in biophysics, right, we already are thinking about the system being in steady state, in a non-equilibrium steady state. And mm -hmm. in this case, you know, the whole entropy, this is kind of where all, the, in, for such linear master equations in steady state, basically all the decompositions agree, all of the entropy production is housekeeping. And so this, or, there's sort of in this limiting, in this special case, there's not, there's not a, there's not a meaning, there's, you know, the, the decomposition becomes just everything is housekeeping. So where it becomes not trivial is when uh, we're not in a stationary, we're not in steady state, we're relaxing towards steady state, but also the steady state is a non-equilibrium steady state that we're relaxing towards. And so for example, if we perturb the motor, right? Yeah. Uh, then, and it's, and so we perturb it away from steady state, maybe the Maybe it's regulated by a concentration of uh, ATP or uh, a ligand or uh, you know whatever, 
or very simple now the, the temperature or something or or, or temperature right um then uh th suddenly the temperature changes right mm -hmm. now it starts it's still in it still has cycles but also has relaxation right, right. so this yeah. this gives us a way to decompose those two those two parts and if we wanted to say for example oh well how quickly can it relax back to steady state now that's where the speed limit would come in yeah. okay this is very and it would say and then it would say Oh, and 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 to relax quickly to steady state, it would have to dissipate a lot, right? Yeah, and this is extremely clear. Uh, so thanks, thanks for this. Uh... And and but, but I just the second part is you know I think I don't talk about this. Uh, I didn't talk about this, and we didn't really talk about the paper. But I think the general decomposition of fluxes due to a subspace, it can be even non-trivial in steady state. So for example. In steady state, we'll have non-conservative forces, for example, due to ATP turning into ADP and, 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 uh, and, the, and the phosphate group, right? So we could now decompose, so for example, we could say, let's imagine we have two motors coupled to each other. We could say, okay, well, let's look at the forces that are decomposed, that are just additive over the two motors. So force one and force two, Okay, that gives a certain contribution to entropy production. Meaning, I'm, so we could think of the non-conservative forces that hold in steady state and decompose those into different contributions. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm making it less clear now, so maybe I should just stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you have two motors. You, you sort of complicate things, but okay, I, I see the point that you can do this, yeah. All right. That there's other other decompositions possible. Yeah. Okay. So perhaps uh, other questions. Uh, if not, uh, if not, I have one actually. So uh, I mean, if I understood correctly, uh, this was uh, you developed this uh, information geometry in terms of discrete states, right? Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, I mean, uh, if you want to extend this to continuous state systems. Would that be somehow you have to work in uh, in like an infinite dimensional? You have infinite dimensional vectors, so you have like a function space in some sense. So it's like, have you thought of doing this extension, or have you tried out, or does it work? Or uh... Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, so there's there's a couple of right. So so interesting question. So you know. Um, there's we can definitely I mean so there we would have probability densities typically right or, or concentration densities right and uh for probability densities you know the thing is almost always physicists when they're dealing probability densities they go to um they work with Langevin equations or Fokker Planck equations and it turns out that Fokker Planck equations basically they're locally in equilibrium so if we think of locally what's happening is diffusion is so much faster than a drift. They're locally in equilibrium. So actually this was first worked out for Fokker Planck by, by uh, Suzuki and Andreas. They, they, they considered this decomposition in the context of Fokker Planck Langevin systems where everything becomes Euclidean and everything becomes very simple actually. So all the projections are just Euclidean projections. All the geometry turns into Euclidean geometry, which is quite interesting. Um, so in that sense, it was already, uh, this is kind of interesting, you know, often physicists start with the continuum limit first, and then they could think of the discrete as the more general, uh, but that's just because when they think continuum, they think Langevin. So there is, you know, there is this, I have been thinking about extending this to, um, reaction diffusion system. So, you know, which would be generally nonlinear. Uh, and that's one extension. I think it can be done. I don't see, you know, you take the appropriate discretization limit. Um, I think it's, there's nothing too crazy that happens. There's another extension that's possible, which is to time extended systems. So I've actually been thinking about uh, what if we think about not, so not fluxes at a given instant in time or even integrated over time, but really fluxes over a trajectory. And uh, there it becomes very interesting because for, for stochastic systems, people know how to do that. People know how to write 
the, the probability density over trajectories, at least for Markovian systems. Uh, and uh, you can, you can, you could, and, and non Markovian systems, and you can do the same thing. Actually, nobody knows what trajectory thermodynamics looks like for chemical reaction networks. And I think I, this is probably a long conversation. I think this actually may give us one route to formulating that. Uh, where the fluxes now depend not just on space or state, but also like on time. But that might be, so it will be, I mean, generally we should think of these fluxes as a measure, right? As a non-negative measure, a measure over what? Here it's a, it's, it's a very simple measure over just the discrete number, finite discrete number of reactions. It could be a measure over reactions in state space. Uh, I think it could also be maybe a measure over space and time and reaction, but I haven't that I haven't worked out. But maybe we should talk about that. So it could be interesting. Okay, if I may ask, uh, I mean, this sounds a bit uh, counterintuitive because a flux is already in time, not I mean by definition, it's a, a time dependent uh, variable. So when you say I have a flux in in trajectory space. I mean, it's almost like uh, it, that's by definition not. I mean, because you have uh, a trajectory is a is, is is a time dependent quantity. I mean, it has time. Um, so it how, has, how but it's it's uh, but it's it's a uh, it's a local in time, right? So so maybe here's one way to put it. So um, in stochastic thermodynamics, you know, how would you let's let's just think about the stochastic level. How would you extend this to non-Markovian systems? Well, for a non-Markovian system, you can't really just no longer, you can't really think about just the fluxes at a given point in time. We have to kind of write the whole, the probability of a given trajectory, which has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the history dependent, you mean? Yeah, yeah, it's about the history dependent. That's, that's, that's right. one, that's one aspect of it. And, but, but, or maybe another way to say it is for a Markovian system, we know how to go from the continuous time description to the trajectory description. And then that immediately suggests how to generalize the trajectory description to non-Markovian dynamics. Cause we just have a measure over, we have get path integrals. That's mm -hmm. a better way to put it. We get path integrals, right? But um, we don't know how to define a path integral for like a chemical reaction network but, th at the deterministic level. But in some sense you can uh, interpret the chemical reaction network also as a Markovian stochastic system, right? You can uh, formulate a Markovian mass, the master equation for the chemical reaction network. Uh, well, it's not it's not a linear system anymore. So uh, well, so but we uh, so so what? what yeah, you, so, the, I mean the, the, the linear system should uh, the nonlinear system should uh, emerge as the either the thermodynamic limit of the stochastic system. Yes, so, exactly. So I mean, if you write everything on the stochastic system and maybe use your uh, your your approach and then take the limit of the whole thing, maybe you get what you want. Uh, yeah, that could be. So so yes. Yeah, so we we think uh, underneath the hood, there's a stochastic description, but it's often extremely useful and convenient to work with a deterministic description, right? And we know now that we can work out almost all of non-equilibrium thermodynamics at even for nonlinear systems at the deterministic description. So, uh, so, so it's just interesting whether we can extend trajectory thermodynamics to it also. But you're totally right. Uh, you know, the, 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 the sort of the brute force maybe approach would be we, and, and the proper approach <laughs> would be, you could write the master, the, the chemical master equation, you know, with infinite state space, infinite countable state space uh, and and write it at the trajectory level and then take the appropriate uh, thermodynamic limit, yes. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, nobody has done that. Interesting. Yeah. I think there's there's space for for applying a lot of stuff still, <laughs> not for long, but people will do all this stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so uh, any any other question around or? Uh, 
I think there was Yael. I saw a notification. That... Yeah. Um, Hi. Sure. <laughs> well, my, my question uh, is, is changing the topic a little bit, but uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned you're going to be working with uh, Richard Sole. And I, uh -huh, uh -huh. and I know his work from, I come from the area of uh, theoretical ecology and evolution. Um, and I was mm -hmm. uh, wondering if, um, um, yeah, with which types of projects uh, would you be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. working on? Thank with you. Him? I, lo I love, I love your backgrounds. Really <laughs> Thanks. Uh, um, so actually, I'm, it's quite a, I mean, uh, I guess, uh, I'm, so it's, it's, it's the project concerns using these ideas from non-equilibrium thermodynamics, uh, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, chemical systems, and so on, to study uh, the origin of life, or to study kind of can we use it to understand some kind of constraints or bounds. So uh, you know, stochastic thermodynamics, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, they're very, I would say, even mainstream tech in biophysics for studying, like uh, modern modern really not not yet at the cellular level, but studying transporters, uh, motors, uh, you know, things like that. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is like, could we say something about protocells or like really minimal, minimal living systems? I don't really know how to do that. So if you have any ideas <laughs> or any, I'm welcome to, I mean, I have some ideas, but it's a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky project, you know, to say something meaningful. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There had been uh, there there were some initiatives that uh, at IS um, a few years ago. I've been in a workshop with. Um, um, mm -hmm. We were speaking about the protocells and um, anyhow, I, I think it would be extremely interesting to go on hearing about it. Um, Kaufman mm -hmm. uh, came to visit at the time, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it was mm -hmm. really, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. yeah, a few people have uh, uh, so. Uh, Kuni Kaneko, who was actually kind of started the institute uh, where I'm at in Tokyo, or helped start it. I mean, he's he worked a little bit on that, and so there is there is a bit of work, but I think it's there's very little actually. There's very little, and um, you know, as, I mean, I think I think in general, my my understanding is there's very I, there's very little theoretical work on origin of life these days. I would say, I think there was a lot more like in the seventies uh 60s 70s maybe 80s and then recently there's been a whole lot of experimental work and really amazing things but i think actually there's kind of room to bring back to bring back some theory and just like i mean like we have a lot of new tools whether they can say something useful i'm not sure so cool. i have a hammer and i'm looking for nails i guess <laughs> <laughs> so good luck it sounds like a lot of fun Thank you. Okay, guys, I think that we went uh, quite a bit, uh, some time over, but uh, so uh, it was a cool talk. So uh, I guess we can all thank Artemi, uh, give a, a digital applause. And, uh, and yeah, thanks also thank for, for, for giving the talk later and on your day over there. So Th thanks. Thanks again.